Hi, I'm John, and welcome back to Dice Paper Miniatures. In this episode, I kick off a new series I'm working on that's featuring each of the 18 legions that players can play in the upcoming Warhammer the Horus Heresy. Now, the framework I'm using for this series is basically looking at what the Warhammer community is presenting in each of these 18 articles. The lore, the general look and feel of the Legion, and of course, its rule mechanics that they're, they're willing to tease at this point. And then maybe down the road, I might have a follow-up as to how accurate I think that these articles presented each of the individual Legions. But that would be a series for another time. All right, so again, that's the premises or framework for this series. I'm really excited to get started and to start the very first episode on this series, I'm actually going with the first legion and that will be the Dark Angels. So with that said, let's go ahead and begin. All right, so here we are with the Dark Angels Legion. And it reads, Legions of the Horus Heresy do everything amazingly well with the Dark Angels. Maybe a little confident. <laughs> Over the next few weeks, in reality, the next few days, we'll be looking at each of the Legionnaires Astartes in turn and showing you why they deserve your loyalty. We will, of course, be totally fair and balanced, so it makes sense to start things off with the Dark Angels since they are the first Legion and also the best Legion. But um bum ch all right, it's a pretty cool graphic. Like I said, um, I'm trying to approach these as unbiased as possible, even though I have kind of grew up on this game and I know a lot of the lore, not everything, but a lot. And I have been refreshing my lore knowledge with Audible books lately, but, but I digress. <laughs> so it goes on. Did you know the Dark Angels are the reason why all Space Marines are known as Angels of Death? Their early battles, fought alongside the Emperor himself, were such spectacular victories, so the story goes, that the First Legion appeared almost divine, and the Soprequent... <laughs> you fuckers. And the Soprequent has stuck ever since. I'm sure I totally mispronounced that word. Soprequet, Soprequet. You stumped me this time, Warhammer community. I'm sure it won't be the last. Good lord. All right. Put simply... They are masters of all trades. Owing to the diverse cultures that made up the original batch, Dark Angels are equally comfortable with gun or sword in hand, on foot or riding a jet bike, and they've hoarded masses of ancient technology since the early days of their existence. Not much of it. It's very nice. Okay. So that's the flavor of the Legion in a few short paragraphs and uh, kind of the general stylistic look. Like the classic Arthurian legend, if you will. These are your knights in shining armor, more or less, even though their armor is kind of on the black side. It's still shiny. But then it goes green, but, you know, tangents, tangents. All right, the rules. This flexibility plays into the rules in the new edition of Warhammer, the Horus Heresy, with Dark Angels commanders able to give their units a subtype from one of six Hexagrammaton Wings, the Stormwing, the Deathwing, the Ravenwing, the Dreadwing, the Ironwing, and the Firewing. Honestly, I didn't realize there was six wings. Back when I was playing 40k, it was just Dark Angels and Deathwings. Maybe Ravenwing. But I definitely wasn't familiar with Dreadwing, Ironwing, or Firewing. That's the more you know. <laughs> Which is exactly why I'm doing this series. These subtypes come with their own flavorful rules in the Loyalist Legionnaires book, available alongside the massive upcoming box set. The line infantry of the Storm Wing turn humble bolters into deadly instruments, while the Iron Wing excel at mass tank battles. Let's look at what that means in terms of rules for the new edition of the game. So yeah, we won't be getting all of the subtypes previewed, of course. We'll see that in the following other legion previews we just get kind of a taste and that's kind of all we're really you know in the early days leading up to the actual pre-order and then during that pre-order window i think it's a good opportunity to kind of evaluate what's been given to us as far as teasers especially if you have no preconceived i must play this faction because i play it in 40k kind of thing or because i've played the past edition of horus heresy i'm going to go with this like this legion uh 
again, we're kind of trying to approach this based simply on what we're getting out of these articles. So just wanted to make that clear. -er. <laughs> so the Stormwing unit subtype, all models in a unit under the effect of this hexagrammaton unit subtype gain a bonus of plus one to hit when rolling to hit as part of a shooting attack, including during a reaction with a bolter, combi bolter, or bolt pistol. All right. A little limited, but not, but not bad. Iron wing unit subtype. All models in a unit under the effect of this hexagrammaton unit subtype may reroll failed two hit rolls of one when targeting an enemy model with the vehicle unit subtype. Additionally, a model with this unit subtype and the vehicle unit type makes all snapshots at ballistic skill, BS, of two instead of a BS of one. That's, that's interesting. Uh, okay. And then it goes on. Would you want to end up in combat with this slot? Other legions may end up regretting their decisions thanks to the Dark Angel's unique advanced reaction. Not only does it solidify the resolve of a unit under threat, it also puts the fear of the Emperor into their foolish assailants. So we have the Dark Angel's advanced reaction. And from what I understand so far, there's multiple just normal reactions, but there's a limited amount of these advanced reactions that you can take. But I'm getting ahead of myself. All right, so the Angels of Death. This advanced reaction may be made once per battle. When a charge is declared for an enemy unit targeting one of the reactive player's units, before the charge is resolved, the reactive player must make a leadership test using the lowest leadership characteristic in the unit making this reaction. If the leadership test is passed, then all models in the reacting unit gain the fearless and fear special rules until the end of the controlling player's next turn. If the leadership test is failed, then all models in the unit making this reaction instead gain the stubborn and fear special rules until the end of the controlling player's turn. Well, without fully knowing what fearless and fear or stubborn and fear does, it's a little hard to evaluate this. I know if you've played past editions of Horus Heresy, you may have a better idea of what those key word types, what they actually do. And then we have the Primarch. So what's interesting about all these legions is they all have their own Primarch. Not to go too far off on that side of the lore, but basically it's the leader of your faction. And this one is Lion L. Johnson. His homeworld is Caliban. Now, again, this being the first legion, uh, they all tend to have more of that classical knight in shining armor look, a little bit more, again, kind of in that line of the Arthurian legend, sort of, kind of. Just classic kind of medieval visual tropes for the most part. Um, and all of the Primarchs have been designed by Forge World. So it would have been really interesting if they would have all gotten a Games Workshop remake. Those tend to come into play for 40k, but we've only gotten two so far. Not to go off on a tangent, but basically Thousand Sons had their Primarch redone for 40k by GW in a plastic kit and death guard as well got remade their primark got remade into a plastic kit uh both of those though are like the demon infused if you will versions that's tangent but i just wanted to point out that for the most part as far as the horus heresy goes the only primarks you'll see are mostly the, basically their human form human ish form done by forge world and pretty much all the main uh, components now of the Horus Heresy moving forward, the standard tactical marine model, whether it's Mark III, IV, or VI. Uh, there's the new Land Raider, the Rhino, the Contemptor Dreadnought. Most of those like core pieces are all plastic now. Forge World will still be kind of regulated to just like Legion specific, like cosmetic upgrades, whether it's shoulder pads, helmets, etc. Uh, although they did announce new helmets and pauldrons or shoulder pads for both the Imperial Fists and the Sons of Horus. I'm not 100% sure, though, if those are just updated Forge World helmets and shoulder pads or if they're plastic. I think they might be plastic, but that wasn't totally made clear in a recent article. Again, a little bit of tangents on this, but I just wanted to point out that all the legions will have a Primarch.
and they will be available for pre-order along with all the other Horacy stuff. But if for some reason you miss it, or if you wanted to order early, you can get these Primarchs on the Forge World website. So it goes on. The accident that scattered the nascent Primarchs across the galaxy deposited Lion L. Johnson on the death world of Caliban. Unlike many of his brothers, he remained alone for 10 years before being found by other humans, growing into a monster-killing legend before he could even speak. Often known simply as the Lion, L. Johnson is one of the greatest military leaders in the galaxy and inherited every bit of the Emperor's strategic brilliance. Few can match him in a fight, and his example spurs the rest of the First Legion to ever greater feats of bravery. He's also the head of the uncounted knightly orders and secret organizations, and a rather handsome chap to boot. Okay. His commitment to mastery in warfare and unswerving loyalty lead many to whisper that he, not Horus, would be the most suitable candidate for war master when the Emperor departed the Great Crusade. However, Lionel Johnson accepted his brother's appointment as ever placing duty above glory. Because he's just the bestest. <laughs> Here we have Lionel Johnson fighting uh, Conrad Kurz from uh, the Night Lords. Yeah, it's a cool image. When the true scope of Horus's betrayal became clear at the drop site massacre, the Dark Angels were having none of it. Unfortunately, they were on campaign far from Terra to the Galactic East, and the War Master sent the Night Lords to slow them down. The Night Lords Primarch Conrad Kurz became trapped on board the Dark Angels flagship Invincible Reason during the fight, leading to one of the greatest games of hide and seek the galaxy has ever known. The brothers stalked each other through the vast ships for weeks, but unfortunately the Lion had to give up the hunt and return to the broader mission before he could finally bring Kurz down. Yeah, I don't think you could go wrong on just the pure aesthetics of what the Dark Angels look like, especially during the Heresy because that black armor is just badass. I I like it way more in the uh, 30K Horus Heresy setting than I do in the 40K, the, uh, the forest or dark emerald green. I'm not a, I don't, I don't dig the green as much. So it goes on. The Dark Angels then made a full speed towards the throne world before the demonic rune storm blocked their path, forcing a diversion to Ultramar. Once their journey resumed, Lionel Johnson's fleet gave up the chance for glory fighting in the Siege of Terror itself in order to prevent the traitor forces from receiving reinforcements, scouring their supply lines, and in some cases even destroying planets, such as the Death Guard's homeworld of Barbarus. Nothing quite says we're loyal, ruthless, and have weapons we maybe shouldn't like blowing up an entire planet. Yeah, that sounds about right. Their actions caused the Blood Angels to reinforce the Imperial Fist for the Siege of Terra, allowing Sanguinius to look cool on the walls of the Imperial Palace while Lionel Johnson was busy doing the dirty work. I don't know. I'm pretty sure uh, getting poked by Horus wasn't all that clean. <laughs> Once again, the Dark Angels made the hard but strategically optimal choices, missing the chance to make history on the front lines in order to tip the balance to victory through their grim works elsewhere. All right. Legion lore. While much of the Legion's doctrine was established before the restoration of their Primarch, the culture of the Caliban's knightly order shaped the future development of the Legion. You can learn their culture, heroism, and secrets in Lionel Johnson's Lord of the First, which reveals what the Dark Angels were doing while the other Legions were winning fame and glory on Ulanor. All right. So the rest of it just goes on to a painting guide, which is, you know, cool. Yeah, a great looking army, I think. From a lore standpoint, I, I do like the Dark Angels. Uh, they have a bit of a plot twist, which you'll have to kind of learn on your own by reading some of those books that were recommended as well as just going back and maybe trying to... I would say the first 12 or so books in the Horus Heresy is a good is a good enough at least starting point as to get the flavor of whatever, what, what caused everything to kind of go sideways as far as the Imperium goes. That's probably the simplest way of putting it. But I think the Primarch model, probably one of the better looking ones, honestly. I don't remember now if this is one of the early ones that were done or if this came out in the middle or one of the last ones. I'm not, I just, I don't recall now. Um, but it, I think it's a decent looking model. As far as the rules go, this advanced reaction, on the surface, it's hard for me to tell how how good it really is. 
And unfortunately, the same is kind of true for these subtypes, only because they only showed us two, right? They didn't show us the other four. I know back when I played Dark Angels, I've primarily focused on Deathwing because that was kind of the, well, the Deathwing Terminators in particular, because back in the day with Space Hulk, which was one of their box games, uh, you played a Deathwing Terminator on board a Space Hulk fighting uh, Gene Stealers. So I'm kind of partial to the Deathwing Terminators, but outside of that and the traditional Dark Angels, I don't have much of a history with this chapter. And in this case, it's, it's Legion. But based on the two that were shown here, from a competitive standpoint, I would lean more towards the Stormwing. If I could only choose two, I would pick the Stormwing. And that partially is also related to a number of other articles and even some of the interviews I've seen with some of the designers behind the scenes and uh, some other YouTube videos as well that had a little bit more inside rumor information. Um, Horus Heresy seems to be really focused on having just a ton of tactical Marines and not as many vehicles. And if you do have vehicles, they're kind of, they're supplemental on the battlefield and they're great for support as far as getting your units onto the board or into the fight. But just to rely on your vehicles to win the objectives and to win the battle, at least first impressions and the initial understanding of how this rule system works, you're probably better off to have just the pure numbers, the sheer numbers of, of uh, tactical Marines. So with that in mind, I would lean towards the Stormwing. But yeah, that's it for this one. Again, these are kind of intended to be just kind of initial first impressions, just based on what's presented in these articles. Yes, I know I bring a little bit of background lore into it for my own for my own experiences but uh yeah i'm really trying to evaluate do i want to go with a specific legion just based on what's presented in these articles and while i definitely like the aesthetic of this legion or if i had to rate them honestly if i had to rate these on like a scale of one to five one being just a no five being a heck yeah i would i probably land at about a three and a half on whether or not I'd want to roll up a, a Dark Angel Legion for the Horus Heresy. I don't think you could go wrong with this. And visually, they're great. Um, they might just be a little more finicky on how they play. Because you have those six subtypes, it might come across as being a little heavy-handed on what it wants you to play versus allowing you to do a little bit more, I don't know, theory crafting. So because it might guide you to to force you into specific units because of those subtypes. On one hand, that could be really helpful. You don't have to think so much as to, well, I just, I'm not gonna play with that unit because it doesn't fit that subtype. But I could just also be interpreting that wrong too. You know, looking closely, looking more analytically at this, you might be able to give units all sorts of different subtypes. You might not have to just pick one subtype and that's like legion wide. You, you're probably able to do some mixing and matching. You might have one unit that's Stormwing, maybe a couple units that, that's, that are Deathwings, that are Ravenwings, etc. So, so you might be able to do some mix and matching, but then you always have to remember, hey, you know, I have a Stormwing unit subtype, but they're not the ones that are basically that subtype ability is not being procced. You know, if it's something like the Stormwing unit and their charge, you could maybe confuse yourself and, and think, oh, I'm going to apply the Ironwing unit subtype. I'm not saying that's likely to happen, but I, I do think as a new player, you could maybe confuse yourself as to which group of models on the table have a specific subtype. Again, I'm not entirely sure if you can mix and match or if it's just your whole Legion has to dedicate itself to one subtype. I do think you kind of have to assume that you could probably do the a la carte, which is why they, they are kind of uh, the jack of all trades, right? Because you could give all these different subtypes of different units, which really could. Again, I think if uh, this is probably the type of Legion that has a little bit more of a skill cap, basically. So for a new player, ease of getting into it's probably not as easy in terms of competitive mastery. But once you played enough and really get a handle on what subtypes go with which units and how you should position those units on the board. Uh, then all of a sudden they, they, they could be really powerful. So that's kind of why I give it like a three and a half. It's, 
it's probably a little more challenging for a new player to really identify how they want to allocate their subtypes. But I do think once you master that, then the skill having that higher skill cap, you could probably do some really efficient maneuvers through the course of the game based on your comfort level and knowledge of how these different subtypes can interact and their positioning on the table. Anyways, that's it for this one. I would love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. Is this a legion that gets you excited to play the Horus Heresy? Were you a Dark Angel player in the past and now you're opting out to go to a different legion? Yeah, I would just like to get your thoughts on it. You know, what are some of the pros and cons of this legion for you? And with that said, if you've enjoyed this content, please consider subscribing to the channel, hitting that notification bell, and sharing this content with your friends. It's greatly appreciated and it really does help with the growth of the channel. Well, that's it for this one. I hope everyone's doing well. Be safe, take care, and I'll see you all again soon. And don't forget to stick around. There's probably going to be another Legion-specific Horus Heresy video here soon. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.